All right, good morning. I know some people be uh, tuning in here a little bit. If you're watching these videos now on YouTube, um, just realize that we first recorded them via Facebook Live. And so then after that, uh, we go ahead and edit, record them, uh, all those type of things. Then we put them back into the YouTube playlist. So you can always look back and find the YouTube. The reason though I wanted to get these eventually on YouTube, which has started now, is because uh, subject matters can be useful to people, maybe not now, but in the future. Or maybe you know somebody who's going through something that could use one of these devotions, and you can easily find them on YouTube rather than trying to scroll through Facebook. Facebook is, uh, good morning, Connie. Facebook is not a, um, a great way to store videos and find and search and stuff. YouTube is better for that. So we're doing the morning devotions live so you can participate as you are right now and you're watching. Uh, but then you can also uh, access them later a little easier. So that's the, that's the difference between the Facebook and the YouTube. Um, I'm kind of enjoying having things up on a playlist, and that way I have things to reference back to or give to people. So we'll continue with that. Right now I have two play, well, three playlists uh, right now on YouTube. Good morning, Shirley. Good morning, uh, good morning everyone. <clears throat> um, the playlist that I got going on uh, right now are uh, on forgiveness, which is the current study we're doing, current devotion that we're doing right now, uh, on worry, anxiety, the will of God, which we did last time, and then I have a special services uh, and a Sunday service playlist going so that you can branch out and see things a little bit easier. Um, that way you don't have to try to find it so much on, on Facebook. It's great if you're just trying to find a video from one or two days ago. Really difficult if you're finding a week or two weeks ago. With that being said, <coughs> Some great and wonderful news that we need to give thanks to God for right now is uh, Iowa is opening up for church services this Sunday. So that means that we are able to actually have a church service this Sunday. I am working right now with some church leadership on that and what that will mean. Um, <clears throat> I do think we are going to attempt to have uh, probably two services as of right now at Concordia. The reason for that is Minnesota is not open at this exact moment. Um, so as long as Minnesota is not open, that kind of limits you know, where we can be. The, the beautiful thing is having a dual congregation is one's across the border and we can always abscond across the border, so to speak. So I'm working out the details on that right now. So I want to make sure I'm getting some of the leadership's uh, direction and advice on that. And they, it has been helpful. Um, they all seem to be, for the most part, pretty for it. We just want to make sure we're taking proper precautions. So there'll be more information. If you're not on the Remind app for Trinity and Concordia Lutheran Church, you need to get in touch with Shannon and you need, she'll be in today, probably sometime after one o'clock. Um, so you get in touch with her over at the church office. Uh, we need to get you on the Remind app, uh, check the website, make sure you're looking at your updates because we'll have some updates about service this Sunday coming through as we figure it out as we go. <clears throat> that is the unfortunate part of all this is I'm a little behind the ball having just gotten this announcement yesterday like everybody else trying to figure out exactly uh, how to put everything together on short notice, right? Uh, but we will make it work uh, and, and figure things out as we go. And hopefully, I know Minnesota is supposed to be until, I believe it's May 3rd or 5th on, um, trying on the lockdown thing. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll keep our ears open for that and see where we're going. Uh, with some cases up here close to us in Minnesota, we might have to... Um, even if we do open, we might want to stay over on the Iowa side. We'll, we'll figure it out. we got a lot, a lot to discuss. But just to let you know, that is the good news, things that we are hearing right now. And uh, we are we're on it as best as we can be. All right, so today for our devotion on forgiveness, we are going to go probably to one of the... Uh, probably to the, one of the most well-known psalms outside of Psalm 23. Psalm 23, of course, is the one that everybody knows. The, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures and so forth. Outside of that, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you probably also know fairly well Psalm 51 in some form or another. And especially in the Lutheran church, you'll know some of these verses because we use them in the divine service, especially around confession and absolution. But this psalm helps teach us a little bit more about forgiveness, how we ask for it, how God gives it, and also kind of what we should expect. 
And so what I uh, want you to do is open up to your Bibles in Psalm 51. Again, I use the English Standard Version. Uh, that's not only the de um, the denomination, the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod's uh, Bible translation of choice. Um, I also do like it for many things. I do find some areas where it, I think it could be a little bit better, but that's going to be any translation that you get. So this will work well for us now. If you have another translation, that's fine. All right, Psalm 51 to the choir master. A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So this is that big incident uh, which we normally use to talk about that commandment. Um, and this is a big incident in, in uh, David's life. And with that, these are probably words shortly after Nathan has either left or Nathan might still be present. But this is kind of David's confession and what he's hoping for, okay? So, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken, and, uh, broken spirit, a broken and contrite spirit, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion, and your good pleasure build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, and burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings, then bowls will be offered on your altar. So several things going on, actually more than several things, a lot going on here. First of all, the first words that David kind of announces after Nathan has come and confronted him, you might remember that story in the book of Kings when he uh, Nathan comes and Nathan knows he can't just go to the king and say, you messed up, that's going to make David mad. That's probably going to put uh, Nathan in a bad spot as far as being the bearer of bad news and so many other things. And so Nathan goes with the story. You might remember that story. He says, you know, there was this, uh, this poor guy. He had just one simple lamb that he loved to feed and it would be in his lap and all these type of things. And then there was a rich man who had all these sheep and uh, he wanted to host a party. And so he went and stole the uh, poor man's sheep and had that sheep slaughtered and then uh, that had to feast. And then, of course, David, having been a shepherd growing up, and I guess you could find a way to, to put this in the modern parallels into your career, whether it's farmer, nurse, or a doctor, lawyer, anything like that. Uh, but this idea of being a shepherd, David is enraged and says that man will be put to death and everything. And then Nathan turns around and says, you're the man. Ouch. I mean, it just hits David because he realizes what he's done. He has taken Uriah's wife as his own and not to mention a whole bunch of other things. Has Uriah kind of offed uh, by, by virtue of sending him into battle on his own for the most part and all sorts of other horrible things that kind of go on. You have to perpetuate the lie and the false witness and so many other things. And so David immediately asks for mercy. And God does give mercy. He, God says he's not going to take the kingdom from David. He's not going to have uh, David uh, put to death and all these horrible things. Yet the son will die. Um, and so with that being said, David cries out, have mercy. 
According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. You see, this is an interesting thing. Out of all world religions, Christianity is the only religion where God actually has to do the work. Um, this is part of the problem. I think when we engage in the world around us, uh, most people are not operating under the un un understanding that there is a divine being out there. Let's just keep it kind of nebulous right now, that there's something greater power out there. And then if that's the case, you have to ask them why they believe in objective morality, and they all do. Um, they might not admit it, and I've met a few of these people in particular. This idea that um, some people think, well, morality is a made-up thing. It changes with culture as culture goes on. We change our values, and to some degree there is a little bit of that. But at the end of the day... I guarantee you there's an objective morality that everybody follows, and it's probably found in every single culture. Although I haven't been to every single culture, I'm guessing this test will work. And this is how you, you test if somebody believes in objective morality. You go up and you deck them in the face as hard as you can. Straight up. They are going to be upset. But why are they upset? Because you unjustly just decked them in the face. Well, what do they base that on? If they base that on something, um, objective morality, that you shouldn't do that, then where does that come from? Uh, is it just a societal norm? Well, then why, do, why, can, then why don't I just change the societal norm? Maybe today I felt like that was a perfectly acceptable thing, and maybe other people feel that's perfectly acceptable. And now you've, you've done away with morality. We're doing that on other things, maybe not punching people in the face, but we are doing that um, in our world today with other morals. And yeah, I'm sure you can think of some right now. So as objective morality changes, um, or at least as we try to mutate it, what we're doing is we're sinning against some sort of divine being. If something has brought this world into existence, we can tell just by looking outside. I'm looking out at the, the tree line right outside the front of the house. There's order. Uh, the way that trees grow, the way that things work, the way the time, he's a God of order. If he's a God of order, he's a God of, um, he's, he's a God of rules and laws. And to transgress them means that you're going against the divine order of creation, of the universe, the rules of, of law. David realizes that. That really who he sinned against is, yes, it's definitely Bathsheba, Uriah, those around the family, this child that is not yet born, all of these things. But ultimately, he sinned against a just creator, and that's a much bigger deal, and that's why he's confessing. And he can only do it by confessing to God. This is the interesting thing. He's, a, he's trusting that God's not going to strike him down right there, and that God's going to allow him to beg for mercy. And as this plays out, we're going to see why this makes a huge difference as Christians versus other world religions. So continue on. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Notice who's doing the action. When you, when you read the Bible, look at who's doing the verbs. Wash me thoroughly. Who are we talking to? God. God's the one who has to wash. Look at other world religions, and that's not the case. The, per, the person who has to be washed or do the washing is the sinner. And there's somehow, we have this idea in our heads that somehow we can do enough to get back into the good grace, grace uh, gr uh, excuse me, the graces of a divine being. Why do we think we could possibly do that? Why do we think that we could possibly make ourselves any better against somebody with, with beautiful rules and regulations and all these things and actually put ourselves back in a right relationship? So David confesses that the only one who can do this is God, which is an interesting thing because, of course, this is exactly what God does. And this is why Christianity will make sense only to a person who first and foremost realizes that there is a transgression before divine omnipotent goodness. And when you realize that, then you have to figure out, well, what do I do to, to get back in, that, in those good graces. And the reason I, I firmly believe in Christianity is because it's the only religion that says God's going to do it himself by giving his son to put us back in good graces. So here, uh, three, for I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. 
Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Again, you know, people ask that question, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? And it'll be asked in different ways. Uh, as I think, I think I brought this up last week. Why do we think we're so good? Uh, God's the only good, and he's the only one who has not transgressed natural, moral, or any other type of law. He is the one who has constructed it. So who is really the judge, and who is really the wrongdoer here? And David keeps all these things in order. Um, let's see. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So again, this idea of even sin from birth, that there's a natural corruption in mankind that keeps us kind of bound towards evil. Uh, we're not necessarily born, or we're not, we're not born into uh, God's good graces because we have, um, we have flaws. Our parents have flaws. We inherit those flaws. Um, and as long as we have those, we're against the order of, that God has put together. And so here, this is also a, a very powerful verse in our day and age, where we as conf uh, Christians confess that life begins at conception. If we can call somebody sinful at the time of conception, then we can say that there's indeed life there. And we need to support and sustain that life as part of God's creation and God's will. Unfortunately, not everybody agrees to that. Um, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. This is kind of going into that confession and realizing what he's done, and he's being taught. He's being uh, disciplined. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. This idea of purity and whiteness and all those things, which I think resonates through many, many cultures. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. This idea of hiding face is interesting. I haven't done a lot of study on this psalm in particular, but isn't that what God does when Jesus is on the cross? This idea that God forsakes his son, turns his back in essence, turns his face from his son, uh, turns his face from the iniquity that Christ bears. Um, kind of interesting things that come out there. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Who's the only one who can give the Holy Spirit? That is God himself. Uh, this does fly in the face of a lot of denominations that believe that you can, you can claim God, that you can make a choice for God or these things. Here, the actions, according to David, who I'm going to say is probably better than most of us, even in his sin, because God chose him to be king of Israel, um, is saying that God's the one who does the actions. He's the one who creates the clean heart. He's the one who restores or renews the spirit within somebody. He's the one who forgives. The actions are God towards us versus us towards God. God initiates the action. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. See, they do believe in salvation. Some people try to say that the Old Testament people did not believe in salvation. Uh, they clearly did. Um... Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. That return to you, that turning around, that repentance. That's what David has done. He's turned around, and God has restored. Uh, deliver me from blood guiltiness. Remember, he had Uriah, uh, Uriah put to death um, in that, that weird way. Uh, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness, of your holiness. If you keep going down, O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. We use this in um, morning and prayer, matins, vespers, these type of things. The idea that God is the one who initiates the opening of the mouth to allow the praises to be sung. We kind of think of worship and praise as something we do for God, but here it's God who opens the lips. It's God who instructs. And so again, Look at how the verbs are going, and that will always show God going towards man. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Here we go. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This is the repentance aspect. Um, the 
when when you're completely broken down and you completely despair of your ability to save yourself, the only one who's left is God. And he definitely can save you. This is uh, this is St. Paul when he says, even though I am weak, I am strong. Uh, the same idea that the weaker we are, the stronger God is, because the only thing we have left is hope and faith to cling on somebody and something outside of ourselves. Um, so the more broken down you get, unfortunately, uh, the more the, the stronger faith, the stronger hope, uh, the stronger God has to be. Uh, so the, the, the faster we, we despair of ourselves, give up ourselves, um, probably the faster uh, we realize that God is actually in control. So kind of bring it all back around um, to, for this study is, yes, forgiveness has to be instigated uh, by God. Uh, he can do that in many different ways. And I think in some sense, um, this coronavirus has caused some people indeed to turn back to God, to wonder, to think through, man, we are not in charge. We have a very insignificant um, uh, say on everything especially when powers that be are always stronger than we are. And then there's always somebody stronger than the powers that be in our land. And so there's always a, a bigger fish, so to speak. Um, and we're rather insignificant in that whole thing. That can be a hard pill to swallow, especially here in the United States of America, where we pride ourselves in being individuals and individualistic and pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps and stuff like that. The point in case is nobody can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Go ahead and give that a shot sometime. You'll probably fall flat on your back. Um, it just doesn't work out very well. And so here, one of the chief lessons that we have to realize is that it's God who instigates the forgiveness. That brings us back to yesterday's devotions on Genesis chapter 3. It's God who clothes Adam and Eve with skins. It's God who first comes and says, where are you? It's God who, yeah, curses, who still brings the punishment and all those things to chastise and to bring us to repentance and all those things. But it's God who is the one who instigates. We're going to see that more and more and more, especially in probably one of my favorite devotionals to do tomorrow, which I'm not going to reveal to you yet because then I'll have nothing for tomorrow. So with that being said, any questions, comments, anything that you want uh, to, to know about, you can type that down below. Um, Again, we are looking at holding services this Sunday. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that will mean. Um, uh, again, holding services can only be done at this time in Iowa. Minnesota is still on lockdown, but again, benefit of being a dual parish, we have both sides of it. So with Iowa being open, that is an option uh, for the Iowa side of everything. So uh, we are looking into exactly what that means. Uh, Pastor Bomer did send me a couple helpful emails this morning um, about um, how to reopen and those type of things. So I need to read that a little bit more thoroughly today. Again, I will continue to put these studies up and add, they'll be accessible from YouTube. Uh, this study will go in the playlist on forgiveness. Um, and as I go forward, as more devotions come, there might be more uh, devotional videos that will go into that forgiveness or into the anxiety. There'll be other categories as well. And the reason I want that resource is so that you can go back and find them um, or look at something if you have questions on a specific topic. Um, and yes, Ghani, I'm excited too because I get to meet people for the first time. That would be great. Um, so... Uh, They'll be accessible uh, there for uh, people to find, to go back to, to share with people if they need to. Hey, I remember there was a, a, um, a good study and I wanted to share it with a friend and it will be easier to find it by topic. That's the reason I'm doing that. So Facebook, tune in for the live thing. If you want to look for something afterwards, check out the YouTube page. Make sure you like and subscribe and all those good things because that does help the algorithms for people trying to search and find and all those type of things. So though, that, that's helpful to subscribe, like videos, share, all those things. Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and be, uh, close our study this morning with prayer as we uh, prepare to go on our way. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks that you have had mercy on us even when we have not deserved it. 
It's by your mercy and grace alone that we live, move, and have our being. And we give thanks to you that you continue to provide that mercy and grace for us through your holy word and sacraments, which are able to make us wise unto salvation and grant us your forgiveness. We ask that this day you continue to be with our nation as we prepare in many spots to reopen our country. We ask that you give grace and wisdom to our leaders at this time, to medical personnel, and also be, continue to be with all those who still suffer from this disease. We ask that you continue also to be with our farmers in the fields at this time. Keep them and their machinery safe as they go to and from their destinations. Be with those that are on the roads and keep them safe, giving them patience during this time. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's holy name in which we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning. Yes, I see a few people uh, chiming in a little late. No worries. Again, this will go up on YouTube itself, but uh, uh, we'll also be here on Facebook for a few days and all those things so you can find them. All right, everyone, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.